Well, good afternoon, Mosaic Church. So good to be with you on this special day. Uh, I'm so excited to be in your midst uh, on today. Uh, The truth is, I'm excited to be anywhere on today. You want to know why? Because last night wasn't my last night. (laughs) Today is a new day. Another opportunity to enjoy life to evangelize the lost, and to worship our great God. And I don't know about you, but every day I wake up, one of the things that I am reminded of is that God is up to something, and that God has something very special planned on that day. And so with that being said, I realize that I'm not here by accident. And you know what? Even though some of you come every Sunday, you're not here by accident. Uh, that God has something, get this now, that he wants you to receive on today and to give. And so I'm ex- so, so excited to be here with you uh, on today. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to get to my slides. Uh, here we go. And so what a privilege it is to share uh, the word of the Lord uh, with the people of God on today. And so I'm excited about uh, this message. I think it's a very special message. I want to use as a thought on today, building a strong foundation of trust in God. Uh, That's what I want to talk about on today, uh, developing a high level, all in trust in God. And let me just start by saying, just, just by being clear who this message is for, trusting in God. Uh, Not only is this message for committed followers of Jesus, but maybe there may be someone here today or watching online, and maybe you are a curious and interested seeker of God. Uh, Guess what? You need to trust in God as well. Uh, This message is for senior citizens and middle adults and uh, for teenagers, and and I thank God because right there at the end, we have a bunch of teenagers who, who... kind of entered into the space, and, and you know what? They changed the atmosphere. And so uh, guess what? It's for teenagers and for children uh, as well. And so here's, this, this is what we want to talk about uh, on today, trusting in God. And our text for this message is uh, two that I want to mention really quickly, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Some of us know it well. Trust in the Lord with what? All your heart. And lean not to your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall uh, direct uh, thy path. Uh, Let me just start by setting this message up, why it's so important. Uh, We're living in some very challenging times. Uh, We're living in some very unusual times. We have a lot of uh, concerning things at the least going on in the society around us and in our own personal family. In fact, uh, this year, uh, 2020, was a very hard year in many regards, right? Uh, So much that uh, has occurred. Uh, We've had uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, which, by the way, is still going on. Hopefully, you're still praying and, uh, and how alarming that is and has been. And then, of course, we had a rash of mass shootings, uh, which unnerved most of us. Uh, so many that was tragic, and probably at the top of the list uh, was the shooting in Uvalde, Texas, right, where we uh, lost sen- senselessly the lives of so many children and, and, uh, and a few educators in there as well. And then for many of you, if you had the time, you could talk about some of the personal challenges in your life, in your family, and in your circle of influence. In the midst of all of that, Many of us ask the question, what's going on? And and, and what is it that needs to occur? How can we overcome? How can we solve? How can we deal with the issues of our day is the question that many of us have. Hopefully you have that question. Hopefully your thought is, Lord, how can I be a part of the solution? And so many of us are wondering, and for some of us, we're looking for answers in what I call the little G, or the government. 
But the truth of the matter is, is that the only solution and the only answer can be found in the big G, and that is the God of the universe. And that's why we got to trust in the Lord with all our heart. I would argue that the answer to the problems of the world is trusting in God. I want to talk a little bit about what that means, but I want to recommend that that is the answer. The other thing that I love is, 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 is with Mosaic Church, that Mosaic Church has a great vision and a great mission. That's one of the reasons why I'm excited to be here today, right? An anti-racial, pro-multicultural church. Come on now. Right? That's a, that's, that's, that's a lot of potential. Right? Mosaic Church has a lot of promise. Guess what? Mosaic Church will only fulfill its vision and mission if, it's, if, if they what? Trust in the Lord. It's going to get hard, and it has gotten hard. The solution moving forward to getting from where this church is to where God has destined for it to be is to trust in the Lord. Right? Thank God for good worship music and uh, thank God for good ministry uh, strategies. But at the end of the day, it will only happen if Mosaic Church learns how to trust in the Lord. And so I think the key to that is this second passage here. I just want to spend a little time before we go into our uh, sectionals just talking about this second passage because for many of us, get this now, some of you have been with the Lord for a while, and some of you are new to the Lord. And you have a desire to trust in God. You've heard that before, and it's something that you want to do. But the challenge is, how do you get it done? In the midst of the difficult things, how do you learn how to trust in the Lord with all your heart, not some of your heart, not even most of your heart, but what? All your heart. How do you get there? And I think the uh, the truth of that can be found in Matthew chapter 7. I love this passage. It's, it's referred to uh, by the experts as the parable of the wise and foolish builders, right? The wise and foolish uh, builders. It's a part of a passage of Scripture that's called the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 through 7 is referenced as the Sermon uh, on the Mount, and this passage, I believe, reveals a very important truth about uh, trust uh, in general and life specifically. Uh, let me read to it really quick. It says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, this is Jesus speaking, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house, and if you will, allow me to insert in there, who built their trust on the rock. The rain came, the streams arose, and the winds blew and beat against the house or the trust, yet it did not fall. Why? Because it had its foundation on the rock. Verse 26, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house or his trust on sand and rain came down and streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. What's my point? That the secret to trusting in God with all our hearts, whether you are a committed follower of Jesus, whether you are a curious and interested seeker, is to trust in the Lord. Now again, just a little background about uh, this particular presentation, Jesus was talking to his disciples, but he was also talking uh, to a group of people who was interested seekers. They were interested in God. They heard about this Jesus and what he had done, and they knew that their life needed something better. And so they showed up. And the thing that I love about God is that he shares the truth, not only with believers, but even with seekers right? And so God is saying the same thing to all of us. If you want a better family, you got to trust in me. If you want a better marriage, you got to trust in me. If you want better parenting, you got to trust in me. If you want to live a life that is truly satisfying and successful, you have to what? You got to trust in me. And so when I come back, I want to talk about what that really means. I want to give us, number one, a definition of divine trust. 
And then number two, I want to end with some developers. A definition and developers of divine trust. How do you get from where you are to where you need to be so that you can live a victorious Christian life and experience human flourishing? And so we want to uh, break off into our groups for uh, five minutes, I believe it is, and we want to have some dialogue around these two questions, and then I'll see you after that. All right, we could have spent the rest of the time uh, just on those questions, couldn't we? And so I just encourage you to continue uh, your thinking on this topic of trust because the truth of the matter is we have not heard enough sermons. Uh, the book, Christian bookstore doesn't have enough book, and we have not given enough thought on what does it truly mean to trust God. And so let me start just by uh, talking about that, let me give you a definition of uh, divine trust. And let me just say this, uh, in the upcoming moments, what I want to do in this message is I want to give you multiple acronyms related to trust uh, just to aid your uh, memory, memory and to uh, make uh, truth about trust more meaningful. And so let's start uh, in an effort to define trust I want to use the acronym TRUST this way, totally relying upon scriptural truth. Uh, to me, that's one of the best ways to define trust in God, totally relying upon scriptural truth. Now, notice in the shaded area, we have some other types of truths that some of us place our trust in, right? Scientific truth. I thank God for science, and uh, science is right about a lot of things, but it's wrong about a lot of other things. Things. And so we have to be careful even with placing our trust in science. For example, th uh, throughout this pandemic, we've looked to the scientific community uh, for help, and at times they've been very helpful, and other times they have not, right? I thank God for Dr. Fauci, right? But the truth of the matter is he was trying to figure it out just like us. But you know what? We could always go to the Lord, even in the midst of uh, the pandemic, there is an answer in God's Word. And then there's social truth, right? Uh, social truth is old wives' tales and uh, ethnic proverbs and uh, cultural wisdoms. And, and again, some of that stuff is wonderful and some of it is questionable at best, right? We can't place our trust in that. And what about that third one there, self-truth? Some of us are gods of self truth. You know, what about my truth? Some of us say and think. And here's the truth of the matter is, who cares about your truth? <laughs> your truth is up and down, is in and out, is all over the place. You don't want to place your trust in your truth, right? But we need to place it in what? Scriptural truth. And so that's one of the best ways to define divine truth. Now, now, let me just read this really quickly because in an effort to define truth, I put some statements in here that I think is very helpful and awakening in terms of what God's uh, trusting in God is all about. Trusting God is the revolutionary and transformational mindset and habit that every true believer must embrace, get this now, that thinks, says, and reacts like God knows exactly what he is doing. That's trusting God. How many of you know God knows what he's doing? Now, listen, listen, listen to this, that God has everything under control. I'm defining what it means to trust in God. Whether it looks like it or not, that the God of the universe superintends all the affairs of the universe on some level. Very few things are coincidence. God superintends the affairs of the universe, right? And here's a great example of that. Like the story of Job, God in his sovereignty either authorizes or allows all the occurrences of life, whether we understand it or not, whether we agree with it or not, whether we want it or not. We trust that God knows best. In fact, let me, uh, let me just... Uh, throw something in there uh, that for many who are here and are watching, 
uh, th this is an area, this is an issue for many of us when it comes to trusting God, and that is with the painful and the mysterious things that occur in life, right? How many of you know a lot of painful things happen? And a lot of things happen in life that makes absolutely no sense to us. And that's part of the reason why we have a problem trusting others and we have a problem trusting God. Uh, for example, uh, the, the, the senseless death of children. You know, how can you trust a God who allows what happened in Ubaldi, Texas, is how some think? But what we don't understand is that trusting God is not the problem. Trusting God is the solution because there will be many things in life that will bring pain, but with pain sometimes comes gain. There are many things in life that are mysterious. And so at the end of the day, folks, here's the bottom line. Unless I learn how to trust in God, I will get stuck I will not be able to move on. I will not be able to go higher. And so when it comes to the painful and the mysterious things, what's the answer? At the end of the day, I got to believe in something or someone enough to just trust what I don't understand. You'll understand it better by and by, maybe. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I got to trust God and I got to move on. Does that make sense? All right, here's what I want to do. Going back to uh, Matthew chapter 7, the key to trusting God with all my heart is having a good foundation of trust. And the question becomes, what does that mean, right? What does that mean to have a good foundation of trust? What that means is there's some things that I need to have in place that will help me to trust in God with all my heart. The problem is that most of us don't know what those things are. I call those things the developers of trust. So not only do we need to be clear on the definition, what does it mean, but in an effort to go to the next level, in the effort to get better at trusting God, what are the developers? What are the things that allow me to have a strong foundation, right? And that's what I want to uh, spend the rest of my time talking about. And so number one, again, I want to go back to the acronym. I want to use the acronym TRUST as a representation of the five developers of trust in God. So let's start with the T here. The T stands for true thankfulness. True thankfulness, being genuinely grateful for who God is and what God has done in our lives. See, here's the thing, I, and, and this is so important. If you're going to build your trust in God, you got to be truly thankful thankful for who God is and what God has done, right? Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. And some of those of you who are parents, maybe you realize this. One of the things as a parent that you want from your children that you need from your children, if you're going to help them to be the best that they can be, is that they got to what? Trust you as a parent, right? You need them to trust you because there's a whole lot of stuff they don't understand yet that they don't realize yet. So they got to what? Trust in you. Here's the thing, though. Our children will only trust us if they are somehow thankful for us. The reason that children don't trust their parents is because they're not as thankful. They are not as appreciative as they can be. In the instances where you find children trusting their parents, it's because they've gotten to the point where they, they are so thankful for their parents right? I really appreciate my parents, and so therefore, I trust them. Why? Because I appreciate them. It's the same thing in our relationship with our Heavenly Father, if you got one. You trust God more when you are thankful for God. And get this, the more you thank Him, the more you trust Him. And so it starts with what? True thankfulness. Uh, a great example is Mr. and Mrs. Job, and I don't want to pick on Mrs. Job, but for the point of the story, I got to tell the truth, right? Mr. and Mrs. Job. Look at that verse there, Job 2, uh, 9 and 10, and some of you know the story, some of you don't. Uh, uh, the Job family experienced maybe the greatest human tragedy in human history, possibly, right? Uh, their loss was historic. And so at a crucial moment, we get this uh, commentary 
uh, between Mr. and Mrs. Job. Job 2, 9 and 10, it says, His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? In the midst of this great loss is the idea there. And she says, Curse God and die. And he replied, I love his, re uh, his response, You are talking like a foolish woman. Now, he didn't call her a fool. I thank God he didn't call her a fool. Husbands, if there's any husbands in here, you don't want to call your wife a fool. He said, you're talking like a foolish woman, right? That's all right, sisters. That's all right if, if your husband says that. Uh, 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 gentlemen, if they have a problem, re reference them back to this passage here, right? Uh, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Now, look at this final statement. Look at this final statement. In all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. You want to know why? Because he was truly thankful for all that God has done uh, for him, right? And so the first pillar, if you will, the first developer of our trust in God is we need to become truly thankful. That's why the Bible says, thank God always. Thank God in all things, right? This is the will of God concerning you. So the first one is true thankfulness. If you want to take your trust in God to the next level, you want to be truly thankful and you want to pray, Lord, help me to be more thankful for the things that I have. All right, pillar number two, the R in trust is what I call righteous reasoning. We must embrace and espouse a way of thinking that is biblical and healthy. Get this from start to finish. We must allow, we must learn to allow God's ways of thinking to control our feelings and not the other way around. So number one, we got to be truly thankful. But if we're going to trust in God with all our heart, we need righteous reasoning, right? The way that we think must be righteous. And the three Hebrew boys is a great example of this. I don't know if you know this passage. We've all heard of the fiery furnace, right? Uh, right, and many of us have been in a figurative or symbolic fiery furnace in our life where things have gotten really, really hard. But this is a real fiery furnace, right? Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace Oh, this is good. Talking about righteous reasoning. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Look at verse 18. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden images that you have set up. We will not compromise on the job, even if a promotion is at hand. I will not, uh, young people, I will not compromise uh, my religious values and my family values just to get in the end circle and just to be liked. I will not do that, right? Because in the end, it will be counterproductive and it will undermine my purpose. And so I will not embrace immediate gratification for future impact, right? Righteous reasoning allows us to trust in God. We have to put on the mind of Christ, the Bible says. And when we do that, we will improve and we will increase our trust in God. I will not allow my political affiliations to dictate where I am at on a particular position. I stand on the word no matter what. I will not tow the company line. I, I will always speak up and I will, I, I will stand up and I will speak out in spite of the consequences. Why? Because of the way that I think. For God I live, for God I die. Only what I do for Christ will last. That has to be my thinking if I'm going to trust in God with all my heart. All right, number three. Let me move a little quicker here. The third one, the you is I call this unusual understanding, right? Joseph and his brothers. We need to develop a good working knowledge of trusting God if we hope to grow at trusting God. Some of you know the story of Joseph, one of my favorite 
characters in the entire scripture, right? Joseph is the one. I don't know if you ever heard this before. If this is the first time, you're going to like this. Joseph went from the pit to the prison to the palace. That basically is a summary of his life, right? He was the kid who God gave a dream. I have a dream. Joseph had a dream, right? And because of his dream, because of who he was, it got him into trouble with his brothers. They got what? Jealous. They threw him into a pit. They sold him into slavery. But here's the thing I love about that. Joseph had unusual understanding. His brothers had usual understanding. They thought like everybody else. That's why they couldn't handle his potential and his success. The truth of the matter is we ought to be as happy for the success of others as we are for our own success. And we ought to wish others well just like we wish our success ourselves. Uh, well, but we got to pray, Lord, give me unusual understanding. Here's the example of it, Genesis 50, 19 and 20. Let's fast forward to the end of the story as it relates to Joseph. Uh, Joseph, some of you know the story, into the pit, sold into slavery. Uh, he was lied upon and went to prison, but guess what? He trusted God every step of the way, and God was there for him every step of the way. And so eventually God delivered him. And Joseph ended up in the number two position of power in all of Egypt. And guess what? The time came where he came face to face with them rascal brothers of his again. And it was because Joseph had unusual understanding that he handled that situation to the glory of God. Because let me tell you what most of us would have did. <laughs> oh, I got you now. Right? It would have been some payback time for most of us, right? But look at what Joseph says, unusual understanding. But Joseph said to them, do not fear. Oh, I love this. For am I in the place of God? In other words, I don't make no decisions. Even with the power I have, I must lean on God, right? As for you, here's the unusual understanding. You meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. People will do things to undermine your success. People will do things to hurt you. But God means it for the good. That's what I mean by trusting in God. How do you love your enemies when your enemies are always against you? Because you trust God. How do you pray for those who misuse you because you trust God? And here's what you understand. Here's at the heart of unusual understanding. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for the good, for those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. And all things mean all things. The good and the bad. And the ugly works together for the good. The mad and the sad and the glad works together for the good. One of the reasons why we're able to trust God in difficult situations, I just got a bad doctor's report. I just got fired from my job. I just got uh, neglected by all of my friends, and I'm able to trust God. Why? Because all things work together for the good. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways and his thoughts are higher than ours, so I'm going to trust God. Look here, folks. If I was God, I would do things differently. I, I really would, right? Uh, if I was God, all good people would get good things and all bad people would get bad things, right? If I was God, good women would get good men. And good, and good men would get good women. And I'd rearrange things, you know. I'd send the bad men with the bad women. That just seemed to be fair to me if I was God. But you know what? I'm glad I'm not God because God knows exactly what he's doing because he has an intended end. And he knows exactly the equation of life and things that need to occur to get the desired divine results. And so that's why I got to do what? I got to trust him, right? Uh, some of us actually think we know better than God does, right? All right. Uh, the S, the S. 
is strong supplication. Trusting God is difficult for most people, uh, but most times we must pray long and hard to receive. Now, I'm giving you the, the formula here, and obviously a part of the formula is prayer, right? There are so many things and situations that you got to pray your way through, right? You got to say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, I trust, but help my untrust. And you got to push, talking about another acronym, P-U-S-H. You got to pray until something happens. When things are going awry in your family, you got to keep praying. You got to get on your knees. You got to seek heaven until something happens. When you feel yourself about to do something and you know you shouldn't do it, you ought to bless them out, but you want to cuss them out. You want to knock them out. You want to get some payback. What do you got to do? You got to pray, Lord, help me, right? Paul says the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Oh, what a wretched man am I. And, and so you got to pray for yourself. And then finally, here's the last one. The T is total trying. You, 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 we need to give a real and concerted effort when it comes to placing our trust in God. You know the story of David and Goliath, right? He was able to defeat the giant because, in essence, he trusted in God. The other soldiers did not. But David, at the end of the day, he trusted in God. And here's the thing, folks. If we're going to build a strong foundation of trust in God, we got to keep trying and trying. A righteous man falls seven times, but they what? They get back up. And let me just say this. Here's the final statement in terms of this total trying. We all have to get to the place where we say not trusting God is not an option. Not trusting God is not an option for me. Doing it a different way is not an option for me. Either you're going to believe that God is who he says he is and that he'll do what he says he'll do, or guess what? Go find something else to do. Why keep showing up at Mosaic on a Sunday if you're not going to get to the place where you say, for God I live and for God I die, and not believing the scriptures is no longer an option for me. It doesn't matter what others around you do, right? There is this collective aspect of our relationship with God, but then there is also this personal aspect of our relationship with God where we say, hey, I didn't realize at this point that I'm going to put my hand in God's hand. And I'm going to wager. My favorite argument for the existence of God, and I'll close with this, is the wagerer. Some of you know the classical arguments for the existence of God. Have you ever taken an intro to philosophy class? You know, how do you convince somebody that God is real? There's the uh, cosmolog uh, the ontological argument, and, the, and, and, and there's all these arguments. My favorite one is by Pascal, right, the great thinker. It's called the wagerer. And he says this. My recommendation to people is that you wager that God is real. Because if you get to the end and discover that God wasn't real, you still lived a good life. And there's value in that. But if you wager that God is not real and you get to the end and you discover that he is real, that the price to pay for that is hell. And so my final statement to us all is that you would wager that you can trust in God, that God is faithful, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And so as we close on today, here's the homework assignment I want to give you. I want to give you a homework assignment. Here it is, right? I want you to ask yourself the question, what needs to happen for me to trust in God with all my heart? What needs to happen? What is it? that will convince me once and for all to place 100% of my trust in the hands of God. What needs to happen? I, I want you to get before God, and I want you to just in your thoughts, I want you to come up with the conclusion 
to that, what needs to happen? That's a very important question, is it not? And then here's the second question I want you to follow that up with after you think about that a little bit. Has it already happened? What needs to happen, but when you come up with something, ask yourself, has it already happened? Because sometimes it happened, but we missed it. Sometimes it's already happened, but we ignored it. God's already sent a person to you to give you a word. God has already shown up in experience. You know those moments where you said, even though you don't go to church and you don't believe in God, but you said, God, if you get me out of this one, <laughs> right? And then God did what? He got you out of it. And then here you come later. God, if you get me out of this one, you somewhere you shouldn't be, doing something you shouldn't be doing, and you didn't get pregnant, you didn't get thrown in jail, and we said, God, if you get me out of this one, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. And so again, let's trust in God. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. And at this time, we're going to uh, uh, transition to our time of communion. And uh, let me just pray quickly. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would take this word and that you would allow it to meet each and, of, each and every one of us where we're at. For those of us who don't know you, O oh God, who are curious and interested, let them know the foundation of trusting in you is trusting their heart to you. And for the believer, O oh God, who have been walking with you for quite some time, that the foundation of true transformation is trusting in you. Holy Spirit, have your way and use this message as our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.